Hey guys and welcome to British Guy Reacts. It is such a pleasure to have you. Now in my last video I reacted to the first World War Oversimplified Part 1. So, naturally, I'm now going to react to um, Oversimplify the First World War Part 2. I mean, the Oversimplify series is great. It's, it's, it's a really good kind of introduction to certain subjects. Before I do that though, I, I wanted to say I've been doing this for nearly two months now. Um, I'm making it very infrequently, but... but sort of two months and I've, I've, I've had great fun but what really makes it worthwhile is the messages I get from you guys so I, I actually I've actually noted down a couple um so this is one that I got as, as a DM it says hi James just wanted to say how much I'm enjoying your channel well, thank you uh, I've been suffering from body image insecurities over the past few years and the more time I spend watching your videos the better I feel about my own physical appearance keep up the good work so isn't that isn't that lovely the, the, the kind of messages you get um i mean i've got another one here it just says die but i'm not quite sure what that's about anyway so without further ado let, let's watch the video it's um it's seven minutes 40 so it's a bit longer than the first one and once again it is obviously from the oversimplified channel and let's go part two with both sides stuck in a hard stalemate, they knew this war wasn't going to be about taking territory, but about simply wearing each other down. The Allies had plenty of men to expend from its okay. overseas dominions. Yeah, that, that maps in. I just want to say very quickly, some people have very kindly said in the comments that I should use a spacebar rather than um, rather than the mouse. And they are so right, it is so much better, so thank you for that. Now, I always to very quickly pause on this map just because um, a lot of people when they talk about the First World War trying to portion blame. Uh, kind of German aggression, German militarism is blamed. And then you look at this map and you see how much of the map, how, how much of the world had been conquered by the Entente powers, by um, Britain, France, etc. And you go, yeah, but I mean, maybe it's not all Germany's fault. But maybe Germany's not the only aggressive power in the world at this time. So I, that, 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 um, that amused me somewhat. Anyway, space bar, yes, British it works. Also started a naval blockade, so yeah. Germany couldn't import stuff like food. Neither side really wanted a long, grueling war, though, so they both thought of ways to break the deadlock on the Western Front. Idea number one, New Frontiers. When the okay. war first broke out, Australia was quick to take German New Guinea. The Allies also quickly jumped on Germany's colonies in Africa, and particularly in German East Africa, locals were enlisted as soldiers. So German East Africa, East Africa is a really interesting case, because most of Germany's colonies got taken right at the beginning of the war um, by the British or the French or the Japanese. Um, Commonwealth countries like Australia. East Africa held out right to the end of 1918. It, it, it was a tiny German force, but they fought a very effective guerrilla campaign. Uh, it's, it's a really, really interesting story. And I, I might say there's a video on it sometime, and, and if not, I might even make one. Um, but yeah, it's, they, they held out longer than Germany itself held out. And it was just this tiny number of German troops and, um, and local allies. And carriers by both sides, leading to a tragic loss of life for the native Africans. That's very sad. Some new combatants entered the war as well. The Allies' new friends were Italy and Japan. Hmm. Japan was busy building itself an empire, so it was more than happy to take away German islands and colonies. Yeah, East Asia. As, as I Italy mentioned. Italy actually had an alliance with Germany and Austria Hungary before the war, but after some tense relations, <laughs> and then the Allies promising to give them some of Austria Hungary's stuff, <laughs> they switched sides. Italy opened up a front in the mountains. So it, it, it's. It's not the main point here, but Italy was one of those countries. It, it was one of the victors of the First World War, but it was also really pissed off at what it got about it. Um, it, it, it thought it deserved a lot more, and that kind of anger, that national frustration, played a big role in the rise of, of fascism and Mussolini. Here, but like everyone else, they were stuck in stalemate for most of the war. Yeah. The Central Powers' new friend was a struggling empire in the Middle East. Mm, the Ottomans. Very nice. The Ottomans were divided on whether to actually join the war or not, since they had been exhausted by the recent Balkan Wars. Yeah. Some of the politicians who did want to join went off on their own and fired some shells at Russia, <laughs> and then came back and said, whoops, looks like we're at war now. The Ottoman entry <laughs> into the war was of particular concern to the British. I, I, I know there was another incident where, um, so the, the Britain had been building two wars for the Ottoman Navy, not what we're talking about, Britain had been building two warships for the Ottoman Navy. And right at the beginning of the First World War, um, the, the British seized them. They said, these are now our warships because we've got a war to fight. And Germany, in a, in a kind of diplomatic triumph, gave the Ottoman Empire two of its warships, um, and, you know, as, as replacements, essentially. And, and this massively boosted pro-German sentiment in, in the Ottoman Empire. So it's a really interesting case of a real diplomacy fuck up from Britain <laughs> and very skilled diplomacy from the Germans. 
since the Middle East was full of oil, and Britain wanted mm. all of that oil. Not much has changed. The tried to attack Russia in the Caucasus Mountains, but they yeah. weren't prepared for the cold, yeah, and brutal. many of them froze to death. Then they crossed the miles of desert to take the Suez Canal from the British, but that failed too. Then the Allies tried to take the Dardanelles at Gallipoli in a long and hard trench war. So Gallipoli is a very interesting battle in the, um, I mean, for, for a whole series of reasons. So for a start, it's it's played such a huge role in the national psyche of Australia and New Zealand in particular. Um, it, it, you know, it's kind of like they're, they're almost their birth of a nation moment. Um, but also, it, the, the driving force behind it was, because it, it was a disaster, um, the driving force behind it was Winston Churchill, who had been in British governments for quite a long time. This was such a disaster, he ended up leaving politics briefly and, and joining, becoming a soldier and fighting on the front line. But so, Churchill was very much a hero of the Second World War. His First World War record is, um, is somewhat dodgy. Warfare campaign, but that also failed. Yeah. The Ottomans blamed their initial losses on the ethnic Armenians living within Ottoman territory. Yeah. And the resulting Armenian genocide led to the deaths of one and a half million uh, people. And that's horrible. Then the Germans sent spies into Afghanistan to try to convince the Arab tribes there to rise up in jihad against the British mm -hmm. and attack India. But that plan failed, partly because the spies got bored, brewed their own alcohol, <laughs> and got drunk, which is a bad thing to do in Afghanistan. So, again, this is a fascinating story. Um, I heard a little bit about this. So, the, the Ottomans... One of the advantages of having the Ottoman Empire on side was the view that it was the state most representative of Muslims. And a lot of Muslims were living under um, French and British colonialism, so the hope was to persuade them to rise up. And it, it, it achieved virtually nothing in the end, but they, they tried. Um, so they sent some people to Afghanistan, and as, as this story says, they behaved in the most ridiculous way possible, um, getting drunk in a very conservative Islamic country, and it was just a complete car crash. And um, in the end, um, the Ottoman Empire itself suffered from, from uprisings, um, with, I mean, the, the Sharif of Mecca joined the Allied side. So both sides eventually had some kind of Islamic legitimacy. Afghanistan. All these new frontiers hadn't done much to change the war. Aware <laughs> that the Allies had more men and supplies than them, the Germans knew they had to do something to break the stalemate. Right. Before the war, there was a big conference that set out the rules of modern warfare. No chemical weapons, yeah. no killing civilians. Basically, don't be jerks. <laughs> the Germans held a meeting and decided to be jerks. <laughs> Zeppelin air raids commenced over British cities. They also started yeah. attacking the Allied trenches with chlorine gas, and they used submarines to sink civilian ships. One such civilian ship was the Lusitania, which had 159 Americans on board when it was sunk, further okay. swaying US opinion against the Germans. Not to be completely unfair to the Germans, the Allies also engaged in chemical warfare soon after, and they had been hiding anti-submarine weapons on their civilian ships, which let the Germans justify the... Yeah, the, um, the, the German submarine campaign in the First World War initially was remarkably successful. So, I mean, what, one of the problems they had is that the Allies just didn't know what to do about it. They were sending their ships, not in convoys, but in you know, one ship at a time. Um, and they were getting hunted down. Eventually, towards the end of the war, the Allies got much better at protecting their ships. They had a convoy system um, where warships would escort um, merchant ships. And they, I mean, they had kind of innovations, like they had some, some fake merchant ships, which actually doubled up as warships. So the idea was that a U-boat would surface, um, try and sink the ship with its guns because it, you know, it's, it's no threat. And then this ship would suddenly turn into a warship. It would, you know, uh, sort of... Bits would fall down and guns would appear, and um, that's a terrible way of describing it. But that's basically how it works. So yeah, they got, they got so much better during the war at fighting um, naval combat. Their attacks. Meanwhile, Austria-Hungary still hadn't dealt with Serbia. Yeah. So the Central Powers enlisted some Ser help. Serbia is definitely the Greece Bulgaria of the First World War. And was still bitter about losing the Second Balkan War. The Central mm. Powers promised to make all of Bulgaria's wildest dreams come true if they <laughs> helped. So they signed on, and together they knocked out Serbia. Yeah. The Serbian troops retreated through Albania, which was neutral but had some ties to Austria-Hungary. So Austria-Hungary entered Albania in a friendly invasion <laughs> to chase down the Serbians, many of whom escaped by sea. It's 1916, and a lot is happening. But... As if they didn't have enough enemies already, Germany added one more to the list. Portugal had been getting a bit chummy with the Allies behind the scenes. And... So P P Portugal is um, Britain or England's oldest ally. Um, and the alliance goes back to... I think the 1200s, I believe. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure on the exact date. Um, but yeah, the, the, it, I mean, it's a lot. It's the oldest, I, think, I believe it's the, the oldest alliance in the world, which is still in effect, um, the Anglo-Portuguese alliance. And Germany didn't like that one bit. 
Around the same time, the only sea battle of the war happened. Both sides had a new powerful class of battleships called Dreadnought, but they were so expensive to build that neither side wanted to risk losing them in a battle. So they kept them in port, except for one time when they had a big fight and a bunch of them got damaged. So yeah. they didn't try that again. So I mean, Jutland was, it was a British strategic victory in that um, the, the British started with naval superiority and ended with naval superiority. But the British suffered significantly more casualties than the Germans. I mean, particularly there was an issue of lots of battle cruisers that kept blowing up. Uh, it's, a, it's a very famous quote. It's all, there, there seems to be something wrong with our damn ships or something along those lines. So yeah, it's well, an interesting example, kind of like Bunker Hill, which we talked about in early videos, of a battle which one side wins strategically, but the other side wins in terms of um, casualties and losses. The UK started conscripting men to the army, so they had mm. plenty of reserves, which is just as well because the Western Front was about to get brutal. Yeah. The longest and one of the bloodiest battles of the war started when the Germans launched an attack around the French city of Verdun. The French defended it desperately, leading to hundreds of thousands of casualties. Under pressure... So I, I've been to the Verdun battle site, um, and just the scale of what happened there is horrendous. I and mean, you can go around some of the old French forts, which the Germans spent months and months besieging um, at, at, at huge costs. But what, what, what really struck me is so that there's one where, um, as some kind of memorial, they, they kept all the skulls. And you can just look down in, I mean, it, it, it's a sort of, I think it's part of a fort, but just in, in this one area, they've kept the skulls. And you can just look down into a sort of river of, of human skulls from, from French and German soldiers killed at Verdun. And it's quite moving, to be honest. It um, shows war really does suck. Sure. The French called on its allies to do something to draw the Germans' attention away. So the yeah. British started their own long and brutal fight, the Battle of the Somme, yeah. with 60,000 British casualties on just the first day. It was also here that the British first used one crazy brand new piece of sci-fi technology. Tanks! The Russians had been... So, tanks is kind of interesting in where it got its name. So, um, the British were trying to hide up what they were actually making. They were trying to you know, keep, keep, it, keep it quiet. So, they, they gave it a name to sound as innocuous and boring as possible. So, tanks, because, you know, at, at the time that kind of meant water tanks, maybe? You know, what, 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 what's this new tank thing? It doesn't sound very threatening. And the name stuck, and tanks are still called that to this day. Um, so yeah, the, the, the name was deliberately designed to sound as unfriendly to the Germans as possible. And ...getting pushed back further and further into their own territory. Mm. But in response to the French call for help, they began a huge offensive. And yeah. did really well until they ran out of supplies and got stuck. Seeing how well the Russians had been doing, Romania decided now would be a great time to jump in and win the war. Mm, nice. And then they got pounded. Ah, not so nice. were fighting amongst themselves about whether to join the war or not. The king liked the Central Powers, while the Prime Minister wanted to join the Allies. Okay. After a brief national schism, during which the country split into two, the king... Now that's not something I, I did not know about that. I, I knew Greece joined the war on the Allied side. I didn't know that they had a national schism. I really want to know more about that now. Um, I, I will almost certainly go and Google that as soon as this video finishes. And finally abdicated and the country reunited. With Allied help, they began a new offensive. Yeah. Okay. In the Middle East, Russia was pushing into Ottoman territory from the north. The British had also made a landing in Mesopotamia to protect Persia's oil fields, mm. and they had also sent a small army up the Tigris River to try to take Baghdad, but the army got sieged in the town of Kut along the way, and eventually surrendered. A new offensive was launched from the south with all out desert warfare. The offensive was aided by one famous British officer, better known as Lawrence of Arabia, who helped ah, lead the yeah. Arab tribes in a revolt that wreaked havoc on the Ottoman supply lines. So th this part is very controversial because the Allies um, made up, or in the British in particular, made a series of contradictory promises. So they promised independent Arab states to the Arabs, and, and in, in return the Arabs rose up against the Ottoman Empire. But the British also made rival promises to, um, to create a, a new state for the Jews, which would become Israel. And also they, they then split up um, the Middle East with France with the sykes pico Agreement. So there, there ends up being these kind of free interlocking and, and mutually contradictory alliance agreements that the British had made as to who was going to get in the Middle East after the First World War. And as you'd expect, um, when the war finished, this became a bit of a shit show. So yeah, it's an interesting case of diplomatic duplicity, but in the short term, it, it worked very, very well because um, the Arab raids were devastating for the Ottomans. The time 1917 rolled around, everyone was exhausted. Mm, there were mutinies yeah. in the French army, the German <laughs> populace was starving, and the war had drained all of Russia's supplies. There was yeah. no clear winner, and it was still anyone's war. The only question now was, who was going to break first? Sure. And the answer was Russia. <laughs> Tired of not eating, and mad that a crazy magic homeless guy was calling some of the shots, there was an <laughs> uprising in Petrograd, complete with riots and strikes. The riots turned into a full-scale revolution, and a new government overthrew the Tsar. 
Then a few months later, the Bolsheviks overthrew. So one very interesting thing about the Bolshevik, I, I keep calling everything the same. Take a drink every time I call something interesting. It will make these videos way more fun. Um, but yeah, so one fascinating thing about the Bolshevik Revolution is the role that the German state played in it. So, I mean, at the time of the February Revolution, which is when the, the Tsar was overthrown, he had a provisional government which was made up of um, sort of liberals and socialists. The Germans put Lenin, so Lenin at the time was in Switzerland, they put him on a sealed train which took him all the way from Switzerland to Russia. Um, and, and not just him, a lot of the other Bolshevik leaders as well. So essentially they were kind of injecting this, the Bolshevik virus, quote unquote, into the, into the Russian system. I mean, there's always been lots of allegations that the Bolsheviks were funded by the Russians. I mean, that, that became a huge thing, uh, actually even during 1917, because the provisional government alleged that the Bolsheviks were, were funded by the, no, sorry, funded by the Germans, what am I talking about? That, um, but the Bolsheviks are funded by, by the Germans. Um, Again, I, I'm not entirely sure how true that is, but certainly there was some very smart diplomacy from the Germans seeing just how damaging Lenin and his um, revolutionary defeatism, his desire to see Russia lose and then take Russia out of the war would, would be for them. And you know, it almost worked for them. It almost gave them a victory. With the new government and they pulled Russia yeah. out of the war. This was great news for Germany, who now only had to focus on the Western Front. Yeah. But there was still one problem. The pesky United States of America was looking increasingly like it was going to join the war. America had been selling supplies to the Allies throughout the war and was getting super rich off the back of it. Ooh, meaning it nice. was in fantastic shape and was dangerous to the Germans. <laughs> so Germany sent a telegram to Mexico saying, wouldn't it be crazy if you guys attacked America? But the British intercepted the message, showed it to the Americans, and that was the final straw. So that's... And I believe that was called the Zimmerman te um, telegram. You kind of wonder, like, what would have happened if that wasn't sent? Because this video implies that was the final straw that led America to, to, win, to enter the war after the Lusitania and the attacks on American shipping. But at this point, if America hadn't led the war, you kind of have to favour the, the central powers. Um, I mean, the, the Russians are gone, so that means Germany and Austria-Hungary can move all their forces to, to the west. The French army is looking pretty shaky. I mean, the, the French have been fighting incredibly hard and suffered enormous casualties. And they started suffering from mutinies, as, as this video mentioned, from 1917 onwards. So you, you, you kind of think that if the Americans hadn't arrived, there's a, there's a decent chance that um, the, the Germans and Austro-Hungarians could have knocked out France. And w without France, it's almost a matter of time before the other Allied powers surrender. So you, you kind of wonder, like, Without this Zimmerman Temer Telegraph, would, would Germany have won the war? And if that's the case, what the hell was Germany thinking <laughs> trying to get Mexico involved? American troops began shipping out to Europe. Yeah. This was terrible news for Germany, and they knew their only hope now was to force France and the UK to surrender before the fresh American troops yeah. arrived. It was now or never, so they started one final attack. They converged their troops and hit hard at the Somme and pushed the Allies back. They hit a second time further north, and then again... So, I mean, it was an interesting series of offensives. Interesting, of course, another drink. Um, but so you know, the Germans' tactics became vastly more sophisticated. I mean, both sides' tactics became vastly more sophisticated with, with things like rolling barrages of artillery ahead of your troops rather than just pounding the enemy and then stopping the artillery and then sending your troops forward to get massacred. The, the Germans had um, elite units called stormtroopers, some of whom used um, flamethrowers, things like that. And I mean, obviously the, the, the name Stormtroopers has become slightly synonymous with, uh, with Star Wars, but that's where the term originates from. So I mean, both sides were getting much more advanced in their tactics, and that's how they eventually, thank God, managed to break the, um, the stalemate of the Western Front. And, and again, with each hit, the Germans were spending more and more resources, yeah. while the Allies were getting better and better at repelling their attacks. By the fifth punch, the Allies held the line and even pushed back. Mm. With American troops now arriving in larger numbers, the Allies launched a counterattack, and that was it. Yeah. The Central Powers were being pushed back on all fronts. Bulgaria collapsed first, followed by the Ottoman Empire. I'd still love to know what would have happened if the United States had stayed out of that war. It would be, I mean, such a fascinating kind of alternative history scenario. So by the sound of things, the Allies were winning on some other fronts anyway. But, um, I mean, I think you'd favour Germany to, to land a knockout blow on France and kind of the UK. So, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting question. Then Austria-Hungary, and finally, on yeah. November 11th, 1918, at 11 o'clock, Germany surrendered. At the peace treaty, Germany was forced to reduce its military, accept war guilt, and pay the bill for yeah. the war. Yeah. After indescribable suffering and millions dead, the world learnt its lesson and never had such an awful war again. 
for about 20 years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it was just a horrendous war. I mean, of course, the Second World War was as well. Um, I mean, it's interesting that the two wars hit different countries. So in France and Britain in particular, the First World War is seen as... Um, I mean, both France and Britain suffered significantly higher casualties as a proportion of their population in the First World War than the Second World War, where it's seen as this horrendous slaughter. Um, I mean, every village in the UK has a, a war memorial which is focused around the First World War, my, my own included. Um, it's, it's just so much become part of the national psyche. But yeah, I say that was, as always, very interesting. Um, I've really enjoyed watching that video. We will move on, I imagine, to the Second World War or maybe some stuff on interwar Germany or, or the Russian Revolution, which I'm also really interested in. Um, yeah, but post in the comments what you'd like me to react to. And um, But yeah, no, thank you so much for being with me and, and thank you for your kind messages about me making you feel better about your physical appearance, which isn't, isn't actually real, obviously. <laughs> I made that up. But, um, but yeah, so thank you very much and I hope to see you next time.